Dzień dobry, moi drodzy. Rzadko robię wstępy, ale kiedy mam gości z zagranicy, to zdecydowanie wypada te kilka słów e, powiedzieć. Dziś moim gościem jest Dean Burnett, który przyleciał e, specjalnie z Wali, żeby opowiedzieć o swojej najnowszej książce i pozwólcie, że ją pokażę. Nazywa się Psychologika. Psychological in English, I guess. E, wydał też książkę, ale wcześniej. Dlaczego rodzice tak cię wkurzają i co z tym zrobić? E, wydał też książki takie jak Głupi mózg czy Szczęśliwy mózg. E, i być może go znacie z różnych półek i e, literatury popularno-naukowej. Naturalnie będziemy rozmawiać po angielsku, więc ci z was, którzy oglądają tę rozmowę na YouTubie, możecie włączyć oczywiście napisy, które tutaj są. Natomiast jeżeli tej rozmowy słuchacie, to i na przykład angielski e, e, byłby problemem, to zachęcam do przełączenia się właśnie na YouTube. I tak właśnie kończę mój przydługi wstęp. Będziemy rozmawiać o książce Psychologika, która właśnie dotyczy e, stanu e, zdrowia psychicznego wszystkich ludzi, więc wydaje mi się, że to temat e, ważny i istotny. And now I'll switch to English. <laughs> More than I could do. So great. Um, it's great to have you. It's great uh, that you came to Poland to, Thank to you. talk about Very your... Very nice to be invited, indeed. Yes. Exactly. About your uh, latest book. Mm -hmm. in, uh, I guess it's the first anniversary of uh, the original uh, release date, I guess. Uh, you're close to, yeah. I think close it's yeah, around, uh, around about that time. Yeah, it's not far off. So um, yeah, the first actual ever release of this particular book uh, in its first form was an audio book in 2019. Oh, really? So it was... Um, so this was first the audio book? Yeah, it was written oh. as an audio book first because okay. uh, Audible asked me to do a uh, a, a, a bespoke book for them. So I did about mental health. And then uh, they said, well, that one fine. Let's, let's turn it into a print book. All right. And uh, here it is. <laughs> Good for you. And uh, I, I guess it's the easier way to translate audiobook to a paper book than to actually create a new book from the scratch and write it first. Oh, yeah. Totally. Or maybe I'm wrong. No, no, totally. Obviously, if it's pre written, then it's um, obviously very much uh, uh, easier to just transfer it into a readable, readable format. But it is different in terms of writing an audiobook compared to a print book because mm. with a print book, a regular book, you can't, you can say, as we saw on page one, or as you saw on, uh, and someone true. could look back, oh yeah, you can't do that. in audiobook, you have to keep repeating yourself over mm. and over again. Say like, as we said earlier, because people can't just scroll back random amount of minutes. So um, yeah, so it was slightly challenging, but got there in the end. Great. Uh, I love the, I love that uh, at the beginning of the book, you have a couple of disclaimers. Mm. You sort of say what you do know about and what you do not necessarily um, know about the, the, the field. And I think that it's the, the best way to start our conversation also with these disclaimers, if you can say those. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's quite a few things. Um, first off, I point out that I'm not a psychiatrist. I'm not a qualified clinical psychologist either. I'm a neuroscientist, which is, you know, I study and understand and have studied and explained things about the workings of the brain, specifically, you know, the underlying neurology, the biology of it all. I'm not neither qualified to nor allowed to diagnose people or administer any sort of therapy because I've not been trained to do that. And that I think, you know, it sounds like I'm sort of selling myself short, but I think it's a really important distinction to make because the a lot of self-help books are out there saying like, this is how you fix yourself. Mm -hmm. And as someone who studies the brain, I think there is no one answer which, you know, which, which will apply to everyone. So like make it clear, yeah, this, this is some information. What you do with it is entirely your decision, but I'm not telling you how to fix yourself or, or giving you any sort of prescription because I cannot do that. And I think it's really important in the field of mental health to do that because there are far too many people who will tell you straight to your face, this is how you fix it. You just got to go for more jogs. Like, mm. I'm entirely sure that works, but okay. But you know, people will do that. And it's, it's a problem. It's a distressing thing. Um, yeah. So like, but I, you know, as I will say, I have, um, feet in many camps. Like I've worked, uh, I'm a neuroscientist, but I worked as a, on a psychiatry lecturing program for many years. So I've had to study and learn about all the different aspects of psychiatry and psychology from my doctorate years, because neuroscience involves a lot of psychology and pharmacology for the drugs and stuff. So, um, I, I probably have the most diverse uh, knowledge base you could hope for to the point where I feel I could write a book about it. <laughs> It's hopefully useful, not just, here's what I think, bang your fist, which is, you, you get a lot of that. <laughs> and um, yeah, um, you know, like, uh, even if I could, I could spend hours and hours tripling the size of the book, working as much as I can, but I don't know everything. No one knows everything. So it's, just, it's still like, a, you know, dipping your toes in it. This is like a primer for... We th this is how we understand it at the moment. Here's some some of the basic facts as far as we see them. 
Uh, no, there's a lot more to it, and I like to make that clear. Like, just because I've written one book about it doesn't mean I know anything about it, and but nobody does. And the final caveat is that if you are someone who reads my book or sees my stuff, and you have a known mental health problem of yourself, first and foremost, you know more about that problem than I do because I have not experienced that. You have, and that's a big thing with modern mental health understanding. Uh, it's been a problem for a few years where you know clinical practitioners, doctors, psychiatrists were adopting a more disease-based approach, saying, okay, you have this problem, it has a root cause, like not enough neurotransmitters or this part's overactive, here's some drugs to deal with it, take them for a few months, come back and see me later. The patient, the individual, was very passive in the process, like they, they're having the mental issues, but they don't get any say in what, what's done about them, mm -hmm. apart from just telling the doctor what's, what they're going through. Now, we sort of, the general consensus is a more balanced approach is needed. You need you need the patient to have some input, some say into the process. It should be more of a 50-50 relationship, not a do as you're told thing. And as a result, I say, I like to make it clear, if you have a mental health problem of any sort, you're more informed about that than I am because you have the lived experience and I don't. I'm just telling you the, the, the data that we have. So those are my caveats. Please don't hurt me. <laughs> <laughs> I think no one, no one, no one's going to hurt be surprised. you. <laughs> <laughs> um, talking about mental you, you you very carefully choose words. You're not you, you're very uh, careful about saying that something is a disease or illness, mental illness. You you try to not to you mm. overuse it. Yeah. Uh, in your book, but you you state and it it comes from the uh, from the res research that uh, one in four people has some sort of uh, mental problems. If mm. I if I um, cite this uh, correctly, so. That's a lot. Mm, yes. it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's like it's a huge amount of, of people with some sort of problems, and um, but they, these problems differ very, mu very much. But all of mm. them come from the brain. Yes, like as do. Like, it's it's a very sort of uh, useful statement for me because it's categorically true, but it applies to pretty much mm -hmm. everything. Everything humans ever experience ever comes from the brain because yeah. that's what that's what experience is. It's a, a function of the brain. But yeah, the. You know, that's that's the common statistic touted, uh, at least in the UK, uh, material about mental health. I'm not sure, sure. If it's the same in Poland, but it seems more worldwide than anything. Like one in four people yeah. has a mental health issue, problem, concern, disorder, whatever you want to call it. And I think that one um, doesn't uh, normally include the word illness a lot because mm. that sort of, it's, a, it's an impressive stat, but it's one of those ones like, well, you can massage numbers a bit. So like if someone has a mental health concern of any point, like with where you draw in the line of what counts as a mental health problem or not. Like, is it, are we talking like low-level stress? Are we talking about a panic attack? Or is it someone with uh, ongoing issues or like low-level neuroses? Or if you include something like uh, phobia, like a, like a phobia, like a fear of public speaking or fear of spiders, arachnophobia, mm -hmm. very common, very uh, everyday. And they, they are a problem if you encounter a spider, But they're not something, they don't stop you living your life because they are, you know, they're not You just minor. avoid, avoid yeah. spiders. Yeah, yeah. Try you, to. You, you, can, you can easily cope the situation, yeah. okay? especially if someone like, you've got a fear of snakes. If mm -hmm. you live in central Warsaw, you're unlikely to meet a snake uh, you know, yeah. unless you go and look for one, in which case you're not helping yourself. <laughs> that's, 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 that's on you. Um, yeah, so you can expand the numbers to like one in four, but it's still plenty of people. Like it's yeah. something like... Something like over close to 500 million have depression, and that's a big chunk of the human race. And uh, I believe we can say that this this number is actually getting bigger and bigger. Yeah, I mean, like you could argue that's a function of um, is it is it depression becoming more common because the world is more For stressful, example, yeah. but, or is it because you know you will have a number of people have depression anyway, and there are just more people in the world, mm -hmm. uh, or is it because we're becoming more aware of what depression is and how to recognize it. All these things will be playing a part. But it's it's undeniable that mental health concerns are a growing prominent problem. I mean, they, they might even be sort of a mixed blessing in that maybe they're becoming more prominent is because physical problems are becoming less prominent. Like mm. in, like 50 years ago, people worried about tuberculosis or certain diseases or cancers and heart attacks and things like or bad diets and things like that. We're a lot more switched on, informed about our physical health now. So You know, people are living a lot longer as a result. You know, we've started taking care of ourselves from a young age. But when like when the physical concerns are no longer you know, taking people out as, uh, as early on, that gives the mental health problems more time to come to the fore. And um, like one of the most uh, rapidly expanding 
types of occurrences of disease now is Alzheimer's and dementia because yeah. people are living long enough to get to that point where mm-hmm. it's a thing. So, um, so that's, you know, it's good news, question mark. Yeah, it's not good news, but it is sort of like, a, it shows, <laughs> it's weirdly, it's a sign of progress in terms of over general physical health. Um, so yeah, so like I do try to avoid saying uh, diseases or illnesses mm-hmm. because I mean, there's a whole section about that. But when it comes to the one in four thing, like, you know, well, uh, that's, that's a sort of like a, a very encompassing number. Like, are we, is everything in there an illness and a disease? And as I say in the book, there's a lot of um, discussion about should you say illness uh, or disease because those yeah. are things people recognize. Those are words people know uh, from the physical health world. But then that sort of uh, puts expectations and assumptions on mental health things. Like, if you say someone, oh, I'm, I'm ill, well, that means you'll get better eventually because you know, people are ill all the time. Stomach upset or like a cold or pneumonia or even like, you know, something like bronchitis or uh, even something like, you know, like cancer is an illness. But you, there are treatments and surgeries you can have. None of these really apply to the average mental health problem, which is all more about coping and adjustment and, uh, you know, uh, trying to sort of uh, cognitive therapies to work around it. So, yeah, so it, it's um, it's tricky in that regard. And also it's a, it's a value judgment in that you're saying someone's mentally ill. I mm-hmm. mean, there's something wrong with them. But what counts as a mental health problem or not is constantly evolving and it's constantly being changed. So there could be something which people say, like, you're ill now, which in 50 years' time they go, oh, that wasn't an illness, that was something else. Like, yeah. So we shouldn't have treated them. No, we shouldn't have, but we did. Oh, yeah, because we thought they were ill. And, yeah, so that's, uh, that's a whole other debate to be had. Also, I believe that um, you've said somewhere that um, very hard is to actually define mental health. Mm. The, the, what, what what does it mean to say that I'm healthy mentally? What what is what, what define that kind of state and who actually is healthy mm. mentally? Yes, that's a really good point. In yeah. that, because obviously physical health is a lot easier to pin down because human bodies haven't changed that much in thousands of years in terms of like the actual shape and function. And you know, if you stab someone in the arm, blood comes out. That's, that's what happens. Yep. You shouldn't have done that. <laughs> we, we knew that was going to happen. <laughs> or, or someone like in Roman times would have had a cold, just like we have now, perhaps. And they would have the same you know, coughing, spluttering stuff. So, you know, we know how bodies are meant to look, how meant to behave. So if someone walks into the room and they're leaking purple fluid from their eyes, they go, that's not right. That's, that's not, not right, meant to happen. Yeah. Let's, let, let's get you to the hospital right away because that's bad. You can't do that with mental stuff because you, we don't know what anyone's mind looks like. We don't know the parameters of it in any sort of concrete way. We don't know the, uh, you know, we can't measure it. We can't sort of compare it from one day to the next in any robust, objective terms. So it's all about how we judge other people's behavior. It's like, well, everyone does this, so this is normal. People don't do this, what you're doing, so that's abnormal, so therefore something's up with you. But that's uh, so that's a tricky thing to pin down because you have to first off, how do you define how someone goes from being mentally well to mentally unwell? Like, mm-hmm. where's that threshold? Like, if someone someone's leg is either broken or not. That's we can keep, we can keep track of that. Yeah. Um, or someone's temperature is too high and too low. Like, yeah, we can we can assess that. Because if someone they're sad, are they too sad? Are they are they, are they For how long? Uh, yeah, for yeah, exactly. how long are yeah. they sad? Yeah. Are they medically sad or are they just regular sad? It's, it, it, <laughs> from the outside. Are you sad or are you from Poland? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> <laughs> well, I couldn't have said that. But if you well, said I it, could. I'm, exactly. So I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm glad you introduced it <laughs> to the to the con- to the con- conversation. Um, yeah. So you, you can't redo really that. It's, yeah. uh, and also, you know, people's minds and behaviors and emotions change mm. from minute to minute. You know, you can meet someone one day; they're really happy and stuff. Meet them the next day; they can be really down and sad. Are they in the grips of a depressive episode or have they just had some really bad news 10 minutes before you saw them? It's, you know, it doesn't, outside it's hard to pin down. And that's why we sort of try to measure like the general, uh, you know, general consensus of the population. Like, okay, the population behaves and thinks like this, you don't, there's the difference. So like, like you say, yeah. with depression, we know that people are sad quite often, like Poland, as you said, uh, but <laughs> it's very rare for someone to be completely sad constantly for two weeks. Yes. Like, uh, like, uh, that, All the, the time. Yeah. As in no, no other emotional state. And that's weird. Like, mm-hmm. So depression isn't really about being sad. It's about being sad or in that negative emotional state for fixed, you know, fixed like that. And similar, like, we can sort of see the, the, the social thing with anxiety, whereas with depression is two weeks. So it's likely to be in a sort of constant anxious state for six months because it's 
very common if you have a human to be mm. anxious about a lot of things at any one time because we uh, have complex lives with lots of things we need to be doing. Work concerns, relationship concerns, like just cultural concerns. Do we fit in? Do we belong? Like, like I said, I'm married, so if you plan a wedding, that's six months of anxiety at the very least. You know, if it's, <laughs> but with a cause, with, with a source, you of know. Course. So, um, yeah, because yeah. <clears throat> you know, it's it's a big job. You know, it's a stressful true. situation. That you want you want to do it, but you know, it's 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 got a basis. Um, so you know, that's not uncommon. So, yeah, but then we sort of uh, over time, people change, societies change. You know, like in a few hundred years ago, it was very common for people to believe in demons and spirits and. And that's how most, most mental health was recognised. Like, mm -hmm. oh, he's talking to himself, he must be possessed by demons. And uh, they would literally drill a hole in your skull to let it out. And that was that was medicine back then. <laughs> and that is true. We, we have moved on a bit, I suppose. A uh, bit, but yeah. you, you say that uh, if one says that he believes in someone living in the sky and he this person, this, this being says something to him and he wants to do something for him and et cetera, some might say that it's not normal. But if you pack it into uh, label or, or just label it as religion, it's fine. So I, I started to wonder why do we, or maybe some do, why don't we uh, um, say that religion is some sort of, uh, not not illness, but some sort of malfunction? Or is yeah. it or is it not? I don't know. Well, yeah, I think there are people who will say that quite happily. You know, okay. They were sort of the very, very strident atheist sorts are very... Um, Right, quite keen and ready to say, but medically, me medically, yeah. Well, because it's um, you know, the real world as we perceive it, as, as we experience it, isn't really the real world in that um, it's there. But mm. there's too much information in the real world that our senses relay to our brain for us, for us to really take in all at once. So our brains are very selective in terms of what we perceive and what we understand. So now our attention is diverted to certain areas, and like we hear and see and smell loads of things at once, but only a small fraction of that can be actually processed properly by our brain. So our brains do a lot of guesswork. You know, mm. If you think about you know, uh, our sight, our sound, our smell, it's all broken down into small electrical impulses in our nerve cells, relayed to the appropriate brain areas, and then built back up into this rich perception we have around us. But to do that, the brain does a lot of polishing and guesswork, and it's like it's like the brain is constantly doing Photoshop. And so well, I think that goes there, I think this goes there, I think this goes there. And because it has like a sort of limited ability to retain information, a lot of our understanding of the world is incomplete. So we fill in the blanks ourselves. So you know, for a long time, we didn't have science and stuff. So people thought, well, I would live in a tribe. There's a chief in charge. So the world seems to keep going. So there must be a chief in charge of that too, because that's my understanding of how the world works. So you must be in the sky. You're seeing everything. You must be a, you know, a big thing you can't see. So... It's sort of, you know, it's not, you can say it's logical, but you can see how someone to get to the point of, okay, so when I hear thunder, uh, mm -hmm. must be gods, it must be the big guy in the sky doing noises, because I don't know what that is. So, yeah, we fill in the gaps for our, our lack of knowledge. So if you're born and raised in a very religious community, we keep telling you there's a god up there, be good, he's watching, you have no reason to doubt that. You know, there's nothing in your senses tells you that's not the case, because you know, things have adapted over time. You're not being, your brain's not doing anything wrong, it's just working with the information it's got. So and then if, but then if the in, new information comes along and says, actually, that's incorrect, it's more like this, hopefully people will go, oh, okay, well, I'll change my understanding. I'll change what I think yeah. of the world. But if everything you believe, or everything you think and assume is you know, in, entwined with that misunderstanding or that, 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 uh, that first information, your brain doesn't like that. Because you're basically telling, oh, by the way, everything you think and assume and believe is wrong. Like that's, I don't like that. I mean, your brain just defense is kicking. And, no, That's no, too much. No, no, I'm not doing that. So, yeah. yeah. So people saying I talk to God all the time is normal. In that, you, know, you can see how that comes out based on our, the society we have around us. Someone saying I speak to an alien called Zeb every day. You're like, really? <laughs> a, no one else does. <laughs> that's that's a. Can, can I see him? Oh no, <laughs> no he only talks to me. All right. Just back away slowly. Hopefully, this guy won't uh, turn violent. And yeah, so you can see how, like, you know, culturally, we have these existing beliefs mm -hmm. which are part of society, and others we don't. So those are treated as more uh, uh, atypical. Let's go with that. And also, we can say that it is normal to believe in something superficial. Mm. Yeah. So our brains really don't like uncertainty. They don't like randomness. Yeah. And when we come to it, our brains try to find an explanation. Because mm -hmm. like, something's uncertain, you mean you don't know what's going to happen, and then it means if it's bad, you can't do anything about it. 
And I'll just, oh, innate self-defense mechanisms just don't like that. So, no, no, I must find an explanation. I must. There must be a pattern here. There must be something I can find. So when you encounter something you don't understand, you think, well, I'll, I'll, I'll find an explanation. I will come to terms with this. I'll, oh, it must be, it must be superstition. It must be uh, bad luck happened. No, that, that, that's too random. I don't like that. Uh, oh, it's because a black cat, that's what it was. And so your brain will try and find these patterns and then it will just, ah, good. That, that resolves that tension. I'm going to stick with that. And there we go. Just crack on. Um, you write quite often that um, science progresses. It, 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 it finds better answers to the old questions. Um, so I wonder, uh, for example, you, you use the example of um, classification of homosexuality. Mm -hmm. A couple of decades ago, it was uh, classified as, as, as an as a illness, uh, as a malfunction. Now it's not. Now it's not. Luckily, hmm. um, I wonder, do you have any other, or maybe you know from your, uh, from the comments from the web, other stereotypes which are like, which people love, but are hmm. like completely false. Uh, and of course, they're about our uh, psyche. Yeah, well, one that keeps coming up a lot, which I kept, I keep asked about and which I've covered extensively in my next book because I was I kept getting asked about it far too much. Is right. I'm gonna mm -hmm. here's my here's my thing about this. Sure. <laughs> uh, it's the whole um, uh, the sex difference, the difference between men and women's brains because oh. those these ideas are so ingrained. People love it. Yeah. Like, every time I'm asked about it, mm -hmm. uh, it's not is there a difference between men and women's brains. It's what is the difference? Mm -hmm. There definitely is one. Just tell me what it is. Like so, <laughs> but you know, there are you know, there, there are different schools of thought. There are different bodies of uh, research and literature on it. But the, the, the yes, the structurally, men and women's brains have differences. You know, they have different sizes because men have more influenced by testosterone, which makes things bigger. Mm. But brain size doesn't really reflect on intelligence as much. It's not. There's no real notable correlation there. So it's not like men are smart. No, they're not. But but because of the... Um, <laughs> Obviously, they're well, not. Not, 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 not innately smart than women. <laughs> that's not a thing that's ever happened, and we know it. Yeah. And um, <laughs> that's... Uh, but no, it, it's, a, it's a commonly held belief. Or men are more logical, more rational. But it's not based on anything uh, concrete. Because although there might be some physical differences in the brain, the functional differences, like what do they do differently, are yeah. really quite small. Like there are some difference uh, of uh, influence of like, like I say, men have more testosterone, so they tend to be slightly more preoccupied with status, which seems to be what testosterone does. It makes you more conscious of your status. Which is why guys are always like, boo, chest beating, I'm going to be better than you at stuff. But contrary to what, you know, people think, oh, men are like that because testosterone, aggressive, alphas, they fight. They don't know it's about status things, but we're humans. We're not you know, big battle bears or anything. We, um, we're a cooperative species. They've done plenty of experiments where If you give men testosterone in a situation where they have to cooperate, they cooperate more. They're friendlier. They're, oh. more, they're, they're more progressive because in this situation, status responds on being the, the, the smart one, the, the cooperative one. So like, okay, good. Mm. This is a, humans value that. So in a situation whereby if we all get along, we'll win. Cool. I'm going to be Mr. Helpful. And weirdly, same thing happens with women. If you give them testosterone, they do the same thing. Oh, really? But... The, fu the, funny, the funniest part of this study was if you told them you give them testosterone but you didn't just give them a placebo they started being more aggressive they started being more like dominant and sort of trying to so it's, it's like an idea of, of, yeah, of having yeah. more testosterone yeah. on your side the idea of testosterone oh nice it's simply more powerful than testosterone itself <laughs> which is it. such a weird thing to think about isn't it yeah. uh, it's, again same thing with estrogen if you give mm. men more estrogen they start being more empathetic more you know, classically female traits yeah. but that suggests that Our actual, you know, our, you know, we might, we might be operating in different chemicals, but our underlying physics of our, our brains are very similar because we respond to the same chemicals in the same way. And, you know, it's all cultural by, by and large. Like this idea that women are emotional and men are stoic and rational, it's just you know, built up over time because, you know, men were allowed to be in charge because we just started punching people until they let us. That is, that is that's true. basically <laughs> summed up <laughs> the part of human history there. Yeah. And um, the women are the child bearers. And, you know, Childbirth is a very, very, very emotional time, and the whole mother-child bond is one of the most powerful in nature. So, I guess women will have that association, you know, given enough millennia, enough generations. But that's a very sort of short part of the average human lifespan, and it's really, really sort of weird how ingrained this idea that we have such fundamentally different uh, ways of mentally thinking when we don't. Like men are as emotional as women; we have all the same neurological equipment for it. Mm. But the expectations are different because like someone mentioned earlier on, we, you get a lot more women being diagnosed with anxiety and depression than men. Now, there's some people that, oh, well, that's 
women don't have as strong brains, do they? No, no, they're just, they're just weaker. Like they're more emotional. But you have a lot more male suicide than female suicide, which suggests to me that no men are having the same issues. But because of the way our culture works, we're not supposed to talk about that. The only emotion men are allowed to have really is anger, because that means fighting, which, which is a man thing, and that's not helpful a lot of the time. So this idea that men have to be stoic and reserved and sort of strong. Yeah, this strong used to mean lifting heavy things, but now it means just not showing emotion at any point ever, which is really yeah. bad for you. It's really unhealthy because we still have the emotions. We still have, they're all still going on up there just as much as anything else. But when we, because we're told, we're encouraged to suppress them and deny them, that's really bad long-term. And that, you know, you need to get to the point where you can't cope anymore rather than ask someone. And yeah, so this idea that men and women have fundamentally different brains. It's the history of how women have been treated in mental health is horrific in many ways. Mm. Like the like the the lobotomy, uh, the idea of severing Very someone's pleasant thing, yeah, yeah. literally stick an ice pick up someone's nose and waving yeah. it around until you sever their frontal lobes. Uh, you see that be done in a lot of doctors' offices. It was like that mundane a surgery. Uh, you know, for particularly for psychotic and dangerous patients, because mm. it calmed them down. Believe it or not, it would do. You just rip their brain in half. That tends to yeah. make people a bit more docile. And yeah, but so far more men were aggressively violent mental health patients at the time, but far more women got lobotomies because they were just expendable. You know, they were they oh were, no, they were not. Uh, well, it's not important as a woman, is it? Just cut her brain out. She'd be quiet then. <clears throat> and that's you no. Know, it's in Bojack Horseman. Like it was covered in that as a as a that's how. You know, salient subject it is. And this wasn't even that long ago. We're talking, mm. this was like the 50s and 60s. It wasn't, um, you know, the dark ages, like my friend told, told my friend about this. He goes, oh, it's like 1790s. No, no, literally within your... Like, A couple you, of decades ago. Yeah, literally within, within your grandparents' lifetime. Like, he's like dumbfounded. But, you know, this is sort of thing that, like, the, the, the term hysterical comes from a wandering womb. Like, they thought... Women, only women got uh, hysterical, uh, overly emotional, because their womb had detached and was wandering in their body, causing chaos. Which, I mean, if you've ever, if you've ever seen inside a human body, which I have, uh, that, that can't happen. That's not a thing that could ever possibly occur. But it was a scientifically held belief for a long time. So, yeah, you can see a lot of things uh, still could stand to change. So that's the, um, yeah, that's the topic for your next. It's, it's in there, yes. It's, it's in it's there. Addressed. All right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Sounds 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 great. Let's <laughs> let's go back to the uh, psychological. Um, you write about um, some of issues, let's say some some of the problems that we that we may have, including depression, anxiety, anxiety. Uh, you write about drugs. You write about stress, about fear. Uh, for example, you you had to choose at some point mm. about what you're going to write to and what to exclude. What are your, what, what are your, um, uh, let's say, what, do, why do you choose what you chose? What, yeah, what what's my criteria? Yeah, yeah. 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 criteria. Um, you know, originally I had planned to include things like um, yeah. psychosis or mm -hmm. like bipolar disorder because those are uh, increasingly common issues and, mm -hmm. but they don't get the same attention that uh, uh, depression and anxiety sure. do. And like a lot of people in, the mental <coughs> health care users community, the people who deal with these problems, do find that frustrating and stressful. And then, like, you know, you say somebody you've got depression, anxiety these days, they got, you can, people will say, oh, yeah, like, I, I sympathize, I relate, because mm. awareness has spread to that point. But someone tells someone I got psychosis or bipolar disorder, they're like, yeah, but that's oh, hard. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, not a, um, it's not a mainstream disorder. It's, it's not as, uh, I hesitate to use the word glamorous or glamorized, but there is an element of that. Because if you see, mm. like, you know, depression is, is, it pops up a lot in fiction now, like dramas and mainstream things. Like, even in sitcoms, people have, you know, like depression. It's something like, you know, I, I think my friend Lowry in the book says about it, cause she's, she deals a lot. Like it's the, the Hollywood impression. It's like a woman in a very long jumper, sitting in a window, staying out, yeah. looking all sad and melancholy, or someone like struggling with like a bottle of whiskey, like in this shirt undone, like it's, it's a very Hollywood portrayal of mental health problems, which aren't the reality for most people by a long shot, but they exist. You know, it's a, the tortured artist has this sort of glamorous sheen to it, this romanticized vibe, which you've never really had with things like psychosis or mm -hmm. bipolar. So I wanted to do that, um, but you know, a book can only be a certain length. So I sat down, my, my first part was like explaining the overall, this is how we think, this is how the sort of current understanding of mental health is shaped. So that was the first chapter. And the second chapter was going to be about depression. I thought, well, I better start by explaining 
how things work in the brain first. Then I thought, I can't disagree. This is not a two-page thing. I've got to, this has got to be a whole separate chapter on how the fundamentals of the brain work, how they can sort of go wrong at every level, uh, you know, cellular, genetically, uh, you know, growth structures and stuff. So the, all of those are places where something can go wrong and a mental health problem can occur. So that left like, oh, I've, I've only agreed to do like five chapters of conclusions. So I've got to pick three now. So, well, I thought, well, this, if, for a lot of people, I've, hopefully this is going to be an introduction to how okay. mental health problems <clears throat> work. So for the most of it, I thought, well, I just, I've got to go with the numbers in that as much as we don't you know, say the other ones should be, should be you know, emphasized more, which is definitely true. Um, depression, anxiety are the most common ones. They by far the most, you know, they afflict the most people. Uh, something like between them, something like, something like 700 million worldwide, which is a ridiculous number of cases. But a lot of those are the same people. Like depression, anxiety coexist a lot. Mm. And when I started writing that, I thought, well, there's, there's a lot of common threads here. So uh, I thought, well, the final part, I thought, well, well, a lot of things are covered. Uh, addiction seems to be one which sort of relates to everything I've said in that it is still one of the more, because I wanted to pick some which is still more stigmatized. Like it's mm. like depression, anxiety, people recognize those. You still get some uh, naysayers, but most people will relate or like at least acknowledge these are things and sympathize with someone who has them. I think that's the most normal response then because of the spread and awareness. But you say someone's got an addiction, there's still a element of judgment to that. There's still a lot of stigma freighted with that. And I thought, well, that's a good way to get into the whole stigma, suspicion, cultural impact thing. And, you know, the whole thing about calling it addiction, that itself is an interesting bit of history because you know, for a long time, the practitioners, the, the scientific community didn't call it that because they were afraid of labeling someone officially an addict means like they would be more too stigmatized. They would be scared to come forward. They would call it something else to stop that happening. So they called it dependence. But that was bad because dependence is a different thing as well. You become reliant on a medicine to survive, which is different to addiction. It's like you don't, you don't do it because you want to, you want to, uh, you know, just enjoy yourself. This is a I, I need this to live, and that's a different thing. So, but then drugs can end up like that sometimes. It's you know, it, it was a very complicated tapestry. There was a vote held, and the like, dependence passed one by one vote or something. It was so down to the wire. Mm. I think which shows that words means mean things, but. Hopefully, you know, if it uh, takes off enough, I would like to do a follow-up at some point where I do delve into the more um, unglamorous side of uh, mental health stuff because I think that is a, definitely a conversation which needs to happen. Uh, so I thought, well, if, if I just go for the, you know, the, the, the poster boys of mental health first and people mm. recognize it enough, then I'll sort of build up enough cultural cachet to follow up with something a bit more, um, a bit more nuanced or a bit more bespoke. So, fingers crossed. We'll see. We'll see how we, how we oh, get. Absolutely, on. I look forward. Um, you uh, you refer quite often to uh, two types of uh, publication. One is uh, DSM uh, edition five, and also ICD edition eleven. So, first is Diagnostic and Statistical Manual for Mental Disorders, and mm. the second International Classification of Diseases. These are two different publication. One is the, by um, the WHO. The second is, is based in the uh, American Psychiatric, Psychiatric um, um, Association. Uh, association. Yeah. Uh, could you say more? Because I, I, I believe that these two are, are some sort of the, the ground to actually have a conversation about yeah. all of the problems, to actually uh, name them properly, to not be out of date and so on, because mm. The uh, regularity yeah. of the publications. Well, like when we say, uh, you know, something's been classed as a mental health problem or something's been declassified, it's these texts where they've been take, put into and removed from. Yeah. And uh, so if they're in these texts, they are almost 99.99% likely to be what the psychiatric world or the mm -hmm. mental health world rec recognizes as a mental health problem, condition, or like a disorder to be something to be treated, or at least recognized that's something that needs to be treated. So, they are, no, they're based, a lot of them, uh, by and large, they're based on a very, very similar evidence base because like, we have this one big lump of mental health data in the science world and both of them are derived from that. So there's plenty of overlap. But when you get to sort of the nuances, it becomes a bit more, it becomes quite different because the ICD is like from the World Health Organization, mm -hmm. which is uh, like, it's a, non, it's a non-profit, it's a global concern. And it's, the ICD, uh, the International Health Authority is, uh, put out there for free for any country to use. The American Psychiatric Association is more dedicated to mental health specifically. The ICD is all health problems, 
So soul psychiatrists work on specifically on mental health and try to classify all the known mental health problems, which in many people's eyes makes it, that's, it's, it's the better one. It's for uh, diagnosing and treating mental health problems, whereas the other one is for recognizing and cataloging all health problems. Mm. So clearly it's got more specifics. But on the other hand, it's the American Psychiatric Association publication. It's for profit. You have to pay for it to use it. And it's very, very American-centric. So like it's also about, it's based on American studies more often than not, on American people who have their own culture, as we know, which is which has expressions <laughs> which we have <laughs> thoughts about, but you know, it's different to, to ours. Yeah. And you know, they have different hazards there, as you can probably expect, and different reasons to be stressed. So you will see different occurrences of uh, what how mental health manifests there. And you like it as you're not, but uh, the American mental health system has a lot of uh, involvement from the pharmaceutical companies. Mm. Now, obviously, we get that in this country. Plenty of people are saying that like, we shouldn't be doing all these meds. It's just big pharma companies um, trying to make money. Uh, we're getting this, there's an argument to be had there, sure. But in most of the Europe and the other parts of the, parts of the world, the medical establishment is like far more independent. And like the like in, in, in the UK, at least, you're not allowed to advertise medicines. That's mm-hmm. just not done. It's like completely verboten. Whereas in America, you, it happens all the time. You get adverts for antidepressants and stuff, which is, someone who's not used to that is mind, is mind boggling. Yeah. So, but you know, they, when they, when they write these publications, the pharmaceutical companies have more of a say in it than is comfortable for the rest of us. Whereas the, I, you know, because they, they do want more money. That's their business. They are profit motivated. Even if you, even if you assume they have hundred percent proper procedures and 100% above board ethics or whatever, they still want more money. They still, that's, that's why they exist. So they will be more likely to lower thresholds for what counts as disease or not, or add things which may not be added because for each condition that's added, if like a thousand people have 10,000 worth of drugs prescribed for it, because it's for the system, that's a million dollars, you know, so why wouldn't they do that? You know, they decline to do it. So, the ICD doesn't have any of that. It's the WHO, all company, all countries working together to do this unique document. So they, they, they all have their pros and cons, their weaknesses and strengths. But they're constantly being updated uh, to take into account more and more data, more information, because, you know, they say, there's more people in the world than ever. They all have different mental health problems, and then mental health issues are constantly occurring. And so each one has been slightly different, slightly nuanced, and uh, over time, like they say, and societies change. Like after 10 years later, it's okay, we don't, Nobody does that anymore. Now we used to classify that as a disease. Uh, like I mentioned, in the book, um, for a while, a criteria of addiction was indulging in criminal activities. So mm. If you did that and two other things, you were officially an addict. But they've dropped that since because they thought, well, people can easily commit crimes and not be addicted to anything. And also with the increasing legalization of things like cannabis, you can be addicted to cannabis and not commit any crime. So, like, so if someone is like, uh, you know, smoking with cannabis a lot, too much, uh, and breaking the law by buying it, that's three things. That's three hits, that's mild addiction. If like then two days later, cannabis in the country is legalized, then the next day they're not breaking any laws. So yeah. now currently now, then they're not an addict anymore, which that's, that, well, that's clearly not the case. They haven't changed, the law around them has changed. So they are constantly trying to update these texts and things like that. So, and there's, there is the debate about, you know, they shouldn't keep adding uh, things which over-medicalize the idea that we, because <clears throat> we try to catalog, catalog everything, we end up recognizing or officially labeling normal human expressions and behaviors as medical problems. Two of the obvious ones, popular in recent years, is that the uh, DSM mm-hmm. uh, sort of recognized tantrums in children and grief in adults as like conditions to be treated. And obviously, there was a lot of backlash against that because you would, you would, you know, like children having tantrums isn't unusual. You shouldn't medicate them out of it. Similarly, if someone dies and you feel grief, that's that's how you're supposed to feel. That's that's how people work. The idea of you know, oh, they just want more money, try to pump people full of pills, and they're having a normal human reaction. And there's that argument to it. But you look, you go close into the details. The tantrums thing was because children who were having chronic tantrums before, like to the point where they were causing themselves harm and Okay, you know, disrupted their parents' lives and everything, and everyone they, were, they couldn't even function. They were being labelled as like something like bipolar. And they were mm. getting adult strength bipolar medication, which is not ideal, you know, for you got a just child's developing brain. So they said, well, if you give it a separate diagnosis, we could give it milder things. So look, just give it a sort of 
Yeah. Small. These are kids. Yeah, yeah. Let's give them their own diagnosis of so they can, they can be a bit more. So we can treat them with little <coughs> kid gloves a bit more. And um, the grief thing, I guess, yes, that's a bad thing to say you have to medicate grief. But it's not all grief. It's just if it's like 10 months later and someone's still in the pit of grief and can't function, they clearly need help. Absolutely. So we need a sort of, you can't just say, oh, it's just grief. It's what happened. No, this is clearly more than that. So you need different criteria. So there's always like, you know, it's always a more complex argument than people give credit for, usually, in my experience. Um, d- what about the quite recent thing which probably devastated some of our um, mind areas, uh, meaning COVID and, and the fact that we had to sit for quite some time in, in, in our hmm. apartment, then in our city, then in our country, and... Everything was different for the last two years. How do you uh, how do you feel about that? Yeah, well, I have a very personal involvement with that because um, like in the first week of the pandemic, my father caught it and then died. And then I uh, had to deal with that during the height of lockdown. So, you know, none of the usual avenues for grief were available to me. I had no one who could support me. I had to still mm-hmm. talk to my kids who were scared and at home as well. So that actually is the subject of my next book. I, all I could do was write. So I sat there and wrote, I dissected my own grief to... An obscene degree by some people's standards, I imagine, but it it helped. It was therapeutic. But yeah, in the you know, obviously, I've, I'm very it's, uh, tuned into all this. But yes, in the in the in in general, yeah, it was a, it was a very big problem for everyone. I've heard so many people in the mental health field describe the next pandemic or the oncoming second pandemic mm. of mental health problems caused by the last one, sure. because. You know, uniquely in the modern world, because this hasn't happened to any of us you know, uh, under the age of, when was it 1920, the last pandemic? So yeah. no one who was like, still uh, mobile these days is really uh, remembers <laughs> the last pandemic. Um, so, yeah, it, it, it deprived us of all the things we're used to in that, you know, there's so many things that the humans do to relieve stress, because stress is such a big part of mental health. That's, what, that's one of the main themes of the book, that... Yeah. Constant chronic stress is a part of human life, but also it's all like the brain's Achilles heel. It can compromise our brain's ability to function to the point where we pardon me, <coughs> there we go. Uh, compromise our brain's ability to function to the point where we can't cope anymore. We can't mm-hmm. process. We can't you know, behave normally and independently. So that's when a mental health problem occurs. But we, you know, we, we, we put off stress and we, we avoid stress. We de-stress by hanging out with friends because humans are so social. We need human interactions and Uh, contact to, to to be what we are. You know, it's a big part of our identity, our sense of self, our sense of self worth, our understanding of the world comes from other people, and uh, we are an ultra social species. It's you know, we're the most social animal you can think of, and or even things like you know, just going out and so sort of exploring new places, traveling is known to be a really good stress release, or, or like just going out to exercise in, or like do all the things we would do, our hobbies and things which take the stress off. And when you live with people, you, know, you need to, you know, you might love them very much, but you still need your own space. We're still, you know, we're social, but also we need privacy. It's it's hard work. It's mentally draining to be social all the time. Yeah. And the pandemic took all those things away from us, the ability to get away from our problems, to get mm-hmm. away from the house, to, to experience new things, to meet new people, whilst adding on a load more stresses. You know, like, like I can't work from home. What's up with my job? Like, the economy seems to be going down the toilet because nobody can go to work or do anything or buy anything. Uh, like there's a killer virus literally everywhere. And I, I've got to uh, learn all these new rules, these new systems to to take into account, uh, you know, which I didn't have before. And they're all like un, you know, inconvenient and they're all stressful. And I can't go near my friends or family or loved ones, uh, except those in my house. And you know, I have to clean everything all the time. These are all massive stresses dumped on us at a time when all our usual stress coping mechanisms are removed. So it's a double whammy of increased stress, which will, you know, would, would, and did, as we saw from the numbers and everything, that impact on people's um, ability to mentally cope. Mental well-being took a real hit. And, you know, how that manifests will depend on the person. But we are seeing just a lot more of it because, you know, the Times just did that to everyone. That, that's absolutely true. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about the stress factor and uh, also the other... Uh, important thing that some of our abilities come from our genes, right? Mm. So isn't it that it just, this is how it goes that some of the people are better dealing with stress and some are not and we just have to learn to live with our own abilities? 
for in, yeah. in terms of stress, of course. Yeah. Well, yeah. It, it's it's a very much um, there are there are models which sort of try and yeah. measure how much stress someone can deal with before they are mentally compromised. It's called the stress vulnerability model. So it's like a graph of okay, you're on this part of the graph, so you can handle this much stress before mm. your mental you know, your mental health declines too far, and then you're mentally unwell. Whereas you're down here, so you're you, know, you can't handle as much. And there's uh, lots of ways to model that, but it'll, it's, it's not so, so direct. Uh, like I say, the, the genetic factor, there are genetic factors which will predispose people to mental health conditions or poor ability to deal with stress. But I think it's always, a bit, always kind of be careful about saying that because a lot of people hear that, they think, oh, there's a gene for stress. Mm. And like, okay. if you have this gene, you're going to be, you're going to be ill. So it's too easy. Yeah. It's, it's not that it's because there's so, you know, so many genes cover so many things. Mm. You can have one gene out of like 50. Uh, if you have that, like you are more likely to have depression, sure. but it's like, whereas before, if you didn't have the gene, you'd be like, you'd have one in 10 chance. Now you've got a 1.3 in 10 chance. You know, it, it's more, mm-hmm. but it's not, there's, there's no guarantee. If anything, odds are you won't. So, um, but yeah, I think people like assume like, oh, one gene equals, oh, that's the, that's the, that gene. And that's what it does. No, no, it plays a part in that because, um, because you know, genes code for protein. So this protein might be part of your amygdala, which means like that protein in that cell doesn't, means that cell doesn't work so well. So it can't handle the fear responses, blah, blah, blah. You know, so, so yeah, there are genetic factors which can make people more or less vulnerable to, uh, you know, mental illness or mental disorders, however you want to describe it, uh, or mentally compromise your ability to deal with stress. But uh, as ever, it's the whole nature nurture thing. You could have a completely clean genetic bill of health, but if you grow up in a high stress environment, so like, you know, from a broken home or the high crime area, you're constantly moving house as a kid, you don't have a chance to settle down and make friends and mm-hmm. lay roots and stuff. These will have an impact on you because it's, it means your brain's dealing with more stress thanks to your life from a young age. So it, it doesn't really get to experience a low stress environment. So it doesn't, you know, those, those pathways don't form as well as they might because your brain's always just like firefighting against stress. So it's resources, it's uh, capacity to deal with stress is always partially taken up. I mean, like someone put the foot in the scales, like, you know, you've got to work a bit harder here. Like, or someone put in, I think in my previous book, I described like, like a briefcase. Like mm. uh, some people, have, you know, we have a stress, a stress suitcase, which is our capacity to handle stress. You know, some people have a big one, some have a small one, depends who you are. But some people have it, you know, I've already put some rocks in theirs because of life. You know, like, so they, they have less capacity. The case is big, yeah. but there's not much room in it because of everything they're already dealing with. So yeah, it's, it'll depend on your life, it'll depend on your genes, it'll depend on your situation. And your situation can change, that's the thing. You can, you know, if, you, if your stress is because of work and relationship problems, five years time, you might have a better job, a healthier relationship, and those stresses are not there anymore. So your capacity has either recharged, replenished, or expanded somewhat because your brain isn't dealing with those things all the time. So your ability to absorb stress is increased. But also practice as well. If you deny yourself uh, the ability to feel negative things when stressful things happen, mm. you sort of, it, it's, in, in, in the moment, you might feel better. Like, no, I can't do this right now. I'm not going to, no, I'm fine. I'm fine. Put a happy mm. face. Don't power through it. Other times you have to do that. I had to do it during the pandemic, obviously, because anything was going wrong in my life, but I had children to look after. So it's just got to put your head down and charge. It's, it's, un, it's often avoid, unavoidable, but it's not healthy. Because when you experience, the brain deals with emotions by experiencing them. The same parts of the brain are used for that. Mm. So if you don't experience them, if you deny yourself, your brain can't access the equipment it needs to process those emotional memories. And they linger and they hang around, they fester. And your brain doesn't have, you know, it doesn't get the training it needs to deal with those further down the line. So next time something bad happens, your brain has less ability to deal with it. So it causes you more stress and so on and so on. So yeah, so the whole bottling up is neurologically a bad idea uh, because it does, you know, it'll impact your stress abilities. That uh, last part absolutely resonates with me Mm. also because of the uh, pandemic and all the other stuff. And I think that um, up to some point I was raised like that to just keep Mm. the emotions inside and and learning to deal with it differently. It's it's something new for me for for Mm. some time. Um, What is the best thing or maybe things that we can do for our mental health 
just like that. I, I'm not saying that it's, it's easy to execute, but it's, it's easy to understand that this would be a good way to do. Yeah, well, I think what I just said is probably uh, the first step for a lot of people in that you will be experiencing stresses, especially right now with everything going on in the world, you know, big and small. You'll be experiencing things that stress you out, cause you to have negative emotions. And the first step is, uh, I'll always say, is to, is to allow yourself to have those emotions, to acknowledge that they're there, that you're feeling them, and that you know, you're not happy about them at all. They might be unpleasant, but they are necessary. They are your brain responding in a healthy way. Try and say, no, I'm fine. Try and sort of insist that uh, your emotional state is different. Is the cause of a lot of mental health problems. Um, like in the workplace, a lot of jobs are high stress and they have a much higher turnover of um, mental health problems, uh, particularly in things like call centers. Like that's mm. a very high stress environment anyway. Oh, really? Because of the demands put on people. I okay. imagine a lot of people watching this will be call center workers because it's such a common job these days. Mm. But it's not just the demands and the, you know, the, the turnover and like the restrictions, because obviously a lot of them are very, uh, dogmatic in the rules, but it's the fact that you know you're dealing with customers and you don't like your job. It's not pleasant to deal with a customer screaming at you, calling you all manner of things. But you can't just you can't react to them as you as you would like to. Of you course. have to be polite and nice. Yeah. So what you're doing, you're not only and it's fake. Yeah, it's obvious. Fake. Exactly. What you're doing is you're expressing an emotion which is different than you're feeling. Yeah, which makes it even worse. You know, I'm, mm. I'm already stressed out, and now I've got to force myself into like. Yeah, it's yeah. Fine. I guess. Thank you for your time, sir. Like it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's extra taxing for the brain, and therefore, it makes them um, more stressed and more prone to mental health problems. So, if you if you are allowed to, or you allow yourself to acknowledge and experience the emotions you're going through, that will be one big helpful step in just you know preventing, but at least delaying the onset of mental health issues because you, know, you are conscious of it you're becoming aware of it and you're giving your brain a chance to to experience and to to, to get through this emotional process which it, which it'll log you're like okay and last time i experienced this this is what happened so next mm. time i'll do that again okay it'll be different but i'll do it again next so it's like you know, you, you're, you're exercising that part of your brain rather than tying it up so that's one thing i would always say it's advisable to do and there is a problem i think in the modern world um outside of you know the the global situation, which always has lots of bad things happening, mm -hmm. but in things like social media or like, I think Instagram is known for this, but it's not just that. <laughs> the whole toxic positivity movement, which is related sure. in that you know, you're constantly told you have to be happy. Yeah. You know, you just cheer up, you know, put a brave face, the only disability is a bad attitude. Very much opposed to these things because again, they, the same thing make you bottle up your emotions. Uh, but the idea that you have to be happy at all times or something is wrong is a very unhelpful, misleading, and potentially damaging one because plenty of things happen which don't make you happy. You know, mm. if you look at the current Ukraine crisis, you go, I'm happy about that. Yeah. What is wrong with you? <laughs> why, why, why are you like this? Like, that's, that's terrible. Um, but yeah, this idea that you have to be happy at all times and if you're not, that's a problem is it's itself a problem. That's really bad. So you know, trying to avoid that. You know, trying to, you know, acknowledge, acknowledging your negative emotions is probably the the thruster I'm getting at. Like these these are things that happen to us for a reason. These are highly evolved neurological reactions because they are helpful, they are beneficial. They teach our brains things. And look, a lot of interesting studies which show like why you know, why do we like sad films? Like, mm -hmm. Technically like, that's a negative emotion. Why would you want to make yourself sad and enjoy it? It's because it allows those parts of our brain to be active mm. in a safe and controlled way. I mean there's a lot of studies which show that people who listen to heavy metal music are counterintuitively the least angry people because <laughs> they you know, listen to that music recreationally, yeah. which triggers the anger response. So they, they act it out and do that. But then after that, your brain's got, ah, done that now. Okay, I'm, I'm going to be angry anymore. Because I, 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 then when something does anger them, they're like, been here before, you know, it's like, I know how to okay. deal with this. So you know, <laughs> th these are ways you can sort sure. of self therapy, self therapy in, in a sense. Mm. But um, yeah, I think just uh, also uh, things what you can do immediate tangible things much of the stress is like the, the, the world the world around you being more you you're at its whims you 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 can't you have no control over it you, mm -hmm. you know it's you, you're subject to the things that happen to you and that's a very distressing state for any particular human brain it doesn't like being out of control so when you if you just exert a sense of control over anything that tends to be reassuring and really helpful in that so even if it's like taking up a new hobby so like you know, i i'm going to take up you know, 
carpentry, for example. Yeah, I don't control my life, but this bit of wood, I'm in charge of this bit of wood. Look, and sure. I made something out of this bit of wood. Uh, I'm, uh, it sounds like I'm being facetious, but I'm not. You mm. can tell to yourself, yeah, I made a difference. I did this, I chose to do it. I did something tangible. There it is. And you'll feel better for that because mm-hmm. it's like, yeah, I did something. I, I'm doing something. And even if like you know, a situation like the Ukraine thing or um, the financial crisis, if you can find something to do, which is tangibly helpful, it might be a minor thing. It's like giving you know, a small bit of money to uh, the Red Cross or whatever, who's working hard for that sort of thing. Then that will make you feel better. So I made a difference. You, you did. You know, it might be a small difference, but you did it anyway. And you, you, you made an active, you took a active role in your own life. And that's, is something a lot of people seem to sort of. I don't think you can underestimate the the power of that to be able to say, yeah, I mean, I'm not in a good place, but I'm doing something and I'm I'm making a change, and that's that's tangible, and that's so much of what our mental health problems, why they're so problematic, is that they are intangible, and so much therapy is about making them tangible, like mm. biofeedback. Like it's not you have like an anxiety attack, you can't say to you stop having anxiety because that's well, I would if I could, yeah. You hook them up to a heart monitor. And the heart's going, like, they say, okay, bring your heart rate down. It sort of separates it from you. Okay, right, I'm going to, okay, yeah, okay, I can do that. Sort of, like, think about it and concentrate. And it does seem to work because mm. you're sort of training yourself. Your brain's going, okay, I don't know what this anxiety thing is, but that I can I can see and recognize. And there's <clears> something called, um, like, the new technology, avatar therapy, which is if you have schizophrenia and have, like, audio hallucinations, it creates a software avatar of your hallucinations and it sort of says them back to you mm. tell them what it says like yeah this so then your brain goes these voices come from nowhere i'm uh, this is distressing and then it goes oh no voices come from that guy hell that guy you know you can it gives you a target it gives you something tangible to focus on and that you know, a lot of mental health is coming down to that so like yeah give gives them a sort of a presence a source which you can your brain can latch on to and then it's easier for it to deal with that's that's very, I've never heard about that. But no, it's new to me as well. It's, it sounds <laughs> very the interesting. Thing, yes. <laughs> but also, uh, when you said about um, uh, people who love uh, metal music, I was uh, just like that. I started to think about all the uh, people who love classical music hmm. as probably they these are the most aggressive people because after listening <laughs> of hours of hours of Mozart or, or hmm. Bach, they just go to the shop and the, the the smallest thing just triggers a huge anger <laughs> after all that. I don't know many classical <laughs> listeners, but I, I'm, I'm happy to attest to that because, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it would make sense, actually. That adds yeah. up nicely. Like, smooth, calm, complex music. Like, ah, discordant noise. Yeah, because yeah, you, you deny yourself the experience of uh, everyday background audio, I guess. Yeah. Um, another topic, another another very interesting thing is uh, neuroplasticity mm. because... Um, you, you you're gonna be talking about this, uh, but it it's to me it is hard to actually um, distinguish places or, or or things that your brain will change about in your, in your lifetime mm. and and things that your brain won't. And neuroplasticity talks about that kind of stuff. And yeah, I I guess it uh, it is really complicated. But mm-hmm. to me, reading about it is very hopeful because the 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 um, the thing that I can see most of uh, of the of it is that we can actually do something about our brain to make it work better. Yeah, totally. I mean, that's um, that's like the basis of a lot of uh, modern psychiatric therapies, yeah. like the. Uh, the, the, the depression model, which relies on neuroplasticity, like, like we said, it's not that you feel in a bad mood or, or a low mood, it's that you can't change it because the neurons <laughs> responsible for changing your mood have become exhausted. They've lost their plasticity. Yes. Neuroplasticity is the brain cell's ability to change, create new connections, get rid of old ones, adapt to what's happening to it. And it's like the source of all the brain's abilities because the brain's not, not static. It can do stuff. It can change and adapt and form new connections, which is how we do everything. Uh, so, sort of like, it's a really important property of the brain. And when it's sort of when it's compromised or lost in some ways, that's when problems occur because your brain's stuck in this state and it can't change it. And a lot of uh, theories, like uh, a lot of the antidepressants, sort of slowly but gradually kickstart these exhausted neurons, giving them their plasticity back by introducing more chemicals and more stimulation. Uh, again, there are other models, but that's sort of the basic gist of the, the fundamentals of this one. And 
Yeah, so but also cognitive therapies, talking therapies. Like mm. people are like, well, how could that work? How can you just talk to someone and feel better? It's not about. It's not just. That, no, it, it is something to be said for talking about your emotions and bent to them. Because like I said, you talk about them, you feel them, you feel them, you process them. So that's part of that as well. But it's not. You know, the behavioral therapy is to coach you to think about things in a different way. So like normally a train of thought goes to this direction, which causes you to feel sad and anxious or whatever. No, no, don't think about think about it like this. Like work your way around it. So you're forming new connections by thinking this way, and they become the default over time. Because like, oh, I'm using this new pathway now, which I just formed. So I'll just use that rather than this compromised one. So you know, it's your brain f- channeling new pathways and forging new connections, which helps us get better. To you know, for want a better word in mental health terms. And um, yeah, so we can change, but. but to, to an extent, you know, mm-hmm. like when you're a child, that's when you have the most plasticity because your brain's learning everything. Like pretty much everything you get as a child, you absorb and you just take in and like a, you absorb all this information, forming new connections every you know, something like a million every second or something. It's it's a it's a lot of information a child's taken in, and that's great. But then, of course, when you hit adolescence, you've got a head full of ten years worth of uh, constant connections, which means the brain's quite clogged with. Like, like, kids will talk about everything, anything and everything for hours. Like, when my son, he watched a Fortnite video and I got a, like, mm. a three-hour lecture about it. He goes, okay, okay, and then what happened? Okay, right, okay, good, good, good. I'm great. I'm glad you're happy. Cause I, don't, I don't play. I have nothing against it, but I don't play the game. So, I, so again, I, who, who won? Again? Yeah. No, 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 I'm only halfway there. Oh, God, here we go. So, or Minecraft could be that as well. Sure. But, um, yeah, so he, he just absorbs everything because he's got that sort of brain. But long term... That causes not problems, but uh, it makes it makes brain inefficient because your brain has all these countless billions of connections that it's never used again. Like he told me that story, but he'll never tell anyone that again because he's mm. so. That's what that's what adolescence is. It's your brain in the mental sense. It's your brain going through all these. Right, I don't need that. Don't need that. Don't need that. And that's useless. Get rid of that. Take all the resources from these connections, which are you know, the brain is quite jealous of, and then put them into something useful. It's basically your brain becoming more efficient and mature. Yeah. But when that's happened, I uh, you know it's still shoring things up. But then when you sort of hit your mid twenties, that's when your brain's all like set. It's not for a while people thought it was fixed in place. Like, you know, that's, that's it now. It's rattled brain, that's what you got. Deal with you know, dude, take care of it, because you're not mm. gonna more. But now we know there's a lot more change going on. But in terms of the growth structures, like you know, this at this point, these are the two your two hemispheres are connected and that's the connection you've got. Or you have your hippocampus is linked to your amygdala by this much great white matter, that's what you've got. Or your frontal lobes are this size with this much many cells in them. No, use them wisely because that's what you've got. But those, you know, so you've got a limited number of cells perhaps, but you can, they can, they can change too. They can form new connections, lose new connections and stuff. And um, I can't remember if it was this book or a previous book where uh, I mentioned that it's sort of like, uh, you know, your brain sort of, it's sort of set, but it's, it's like, like you've got an army of like 500 troops. Someone's mm. got, a thousand, someone's got 200, but you've got 500. So like you, you can't have any more, you can't, you, I know you can lose them, but you, can, you ideally won't do that. So, but you can do a lot of things with that. He said, right, yeah. this army, I want them to be uh, Marines. So let's do all the Marine training. Like now they're all good training. Sure. Now. now I want them to be, so I want half of them to be super strong. So these guys all go to the gym all day, every day. So now I've got 50, 250 super strong soldiers. You can do all that. That's what you're doing with your brain. Like, so I've got this many brain cells with this sort of layout, but there's a lot to work with there. And you can do that. You can say, okay, so I've developed this way of thinking, which is unhelpful. I can change that. It takes time, it takes effort, and it, it's, it's hard to do because you can't quite, you can't see it, but you, over time you can work on it. So you, you, you do have that sort of flexibility. So I mean, it, it declines as you get older, but it never goes away. So yeah, you, ideally, unless something goes you know, very wrong, you'll mm. always have the ability to change, the ability to fix or at least help improve what, what, you, what you're thinking and feeling. And uh, since you said about helping, uh, other uh, thing to, to, to that may help you is using some sort of drug substances, which you also include in the in the book. You, you write about the uh, uh, drugs or or, um, or things that we can we can use uh, prescribed or not, and um, some of them. Uh, for example, I think you mentioned, for example, ketamine as one mm. of the uh, things that may actually help curing uh, depression. Mm. But 
It's tricky, so please tell us yes. about that. Yes, obviously ketamine is a quite a strong narcotic in, yeah. <laughs> by modern standards. Uh, primarily uses a horse tranquilizer, so again, how that oh, ended. really? Yeah, that, that was his first and still primary use, I think. So how it ended up mm. as a recreational drug for humans, I don't know. I mean, who was the first person who thought, you know what? You know what? <laughs> I'm going to have a go with this horse what? tranquil. Wait a minute. <laughs> what is that bottle doing? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Like some, somebody should be there going, why? Mm. <laughs> I want to sleep like a horse. Uh, yeah. Oh, all right. <laughs> Weirdo. Yeah. But yeah, so it's a, it's a powerful narcotic. But it's um, it's now being trialed in the States. Or at least yeah. it was pre-pandemic. This was when I wrote it. So it's probably, I think it's been coming along come a lot further since, but as an antidepressant, because you know, we have a lot of antidepressants to choose from. Your, your SSRIs, the typical ones, like your fluoxetines and things, but they're, um, they all have the same sort of uh, limitations in that usually, by most, in, almost in, invariably, it takes them like two to three weeks to kick in. Uh, the side effects kick in straight away, but the, 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 the beneficial effects take a while. So they're not fun. You know, like, I think there's every the case of when addicted to antidepressants because they're not nice. <laughs> no one likes them. They're just helpful. Um, mm. And like the SSRIs are the most common ones, not because they're the best ones, actually one of the weakest ones we've got, but mm. they're also, they have the fewer side effects. So odds are like if they work for you, great. If they don't, we'll try something stronger, but you know, that's the go-to is if, they, if, if you have a bad reaction, you have a small bad reaction with these. So yeah, so antidepressants have been quite you know, static for a while. And like a lot of people go, I wish we had something better to offer you, but mm. we don't. But um, yeah, but then they found that ketamine has pretty powerful antidepressant effects and it kicks in somewhere between like a few hours or the next day, which is like, well, that's qu- quite a game changer. You know, imagine having depression for, for months and then it's, it's a nasal spray, it's not even a pill. It's like, mm. tss, tss, like next day, like, okay, I feel better now. That's nice. Um, so that's it. That's it. Not, not, not with everyone. That's with every drug, every brain is different. Like, but uh, it was quite a reliable and consistent result. So, okay, so this is good. But part of it's because the usual uh, antidepressants, uh, the, the drugs, they work on the monoamine system, which is a certain class of neurotransmitter networks in the brain, which use monoamine neurotransmitters, serotonin, dop- dopamine, very important, sort of like omnipresent, but they make a very small percentage of the brain's overall network. So like, it's like, I think I compared it, it's like the veins in marble, like they're mm. there, you see them all over the place, but they don't make up much of the mass. The brain usually, mostly uses glutamate uh, neurons, which are like the most common stimulation uh, neurotransmitter. And ketamine works on glutamate receptors. So it has a much more global effect and a more faster one. So it stimulates the brain far more. And one argument is that it sort of kickstarts the sluggish neurons a lot faster because it's working with so much of the different parts of the brain. Um, you know, there's lots of different models of it. Um, like uh, is it, uh, psych- uh, psychedelics are becoming far more um, targets of interest now for yeah. curing depression. And one of them, and ketamine has some overlap there because they do it by the glutamate system. But what they do, it's believed, is... Uh, sort of alter the brain's default network, which is the part of the brain which is active when we're not doing anything else. So it's almost like the sort of the foundation of the brain. So sort of this is the part of the brain which is, it's like the skeleton holding all our thoughts together. Yeah, okay, it just so, is. Yeah, it's just like, this yeah. is, it's the framework. So, yeah. okay, so I'll connect you to you, like the default network. It's just like when nothing else is happening, that's active because it's just keeping everything ticking over. Yeah. And psychedelics sort of like shut that down a bit. It sounds terrible, uh, but it sort of, it means <laughs> that part, that's the part of the brain, it's, like, it's the framework, it holds mm-hmm. everything in place. So when it's weakened, things sort of overlap and blur together. So you sort of thought, I had a thought and I saw it, that's, that's weird, yeah, because like, the thinking part is now suddenly bleeding into the visual part sure. and the, the smell of color, then it's like, oh God, <laughs> it, it, your brain's all, whoa. It kicks back in, but it's sort of, everything's been reset a bit. It's, it's, like, it's, like, it's almost like a reboot for the brain. Mm-hmm. And like, that's, so it's, it's quite a reliable, in terms of the current evidence we have, because we've already got started researching again, because they've only just re- lowered the restrictions on it. Yeah, it seems to be a, almost like a catch-all treatment for lots of things, like addiction even, or mm. like alcoholism, because mm-hmm. like, it disrupts the existing pathways which are causing your mental health problem, whatever it is, and sort of reduces its influence. So like 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 a, like a clean slate, essentially. So that's what we think is happening, or at least, uh, but ketamine does that to a certain extent as well, but milder, so it's a more sort of gentle uh, antidepressant than a psychedelic but then people are like well that means it's shorter lasting so you have to keep taking it whereas a psychedelic can have like a massive effect, impact that lasts you for ages so yeah this is all very much in the lab at the moment like we think that's the case but 
If it turns out not to be the case, apologies for getting anyone's hopes up, but if it does, you know, if there's any sort of uh, generalization for this, it's going to be really quite a, we're looking at interesting times for the um, you know, men, mental health treatments, you know, some interesting things coming on the line. Absolutely. Uh, I wonder, um, is there, because neuroscience is is huge, mm-hmm. we know, we don't know many things about uh, human brain and we will gradually have this uh, uh, knowledge. Do you have some sort of um, dream to learn about something particular new mm. you, you always wonder about? Yeah, um, well, lots of things because I'm sort of <laughs> one of the very I'm one of the few sort of general neuroscientists because most yeah. of them specialize. Sure, because like, uh, like I do sometimes get asked questions like, "You're a guy who knows about the brain. How, yeah. how does this work? Like, yeah. <laughs> how brain works? Yeah, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, I've been asked that as well. That's uh, the best one I ever had was in Amsterdam. Uh, I did a talk there, and yeah. like a half, I also did an hour of questions afterwards. Look at my watch. I got two minutes left. I was very tired. I was very sort of, yeah. Okay, so one more question. I got two minutes. Uh, one last quick question. Skype as Adam said, "Is free will real?" That's not a two-minute question. <laughs> That's like five thousand years of philosophy and counting. Uh, come again? It was in in Amsterdam. Yeah, yeah it was Amsterdam. So it was like straight from coffee shop. One <laughs> huge <laughs> blunt, and then I didn't want to uh, say that, but sir, I was thinking it. Saying, sir, free will hey. <laughs> does God exist? Yeah. <laughs> thank, thank you for that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was really appreciated. <laughs> Lovely. Yeah. So. um Uh, well, I said to him, did you want to ask that question? Is <laughs> yes. Well, yes, it is. Then I just, just got a cop okay. out. But, okay. <laughs> nice yeah, short one. Yeah, but like, so sometimes I can ask the question, sure. and they said, "Well, you're a brain surgeon or neuroscientist," and mm-hmm. uh, yeah, but that's it's a big field. Isn't it? It's like yeah. it's like asking someone like you're a historian. Yes, yes. Can you translate these hieroglyphics? I said, no, I do. <laughs> 19th century European <laughs> agriculture. That's not really my. It's all history, isn't it? No, no, no. It's lots of it. It's, it's yeah. So um, yeah. So I'm as probably as general as it gets, but. Mm-hmm. Uh, Yeah, so obviously I've got a background in comedy and humor as well, so I've always been particularly um, drawn to that side of things. I think it's my second book. I sort of looked at the experiments where, like, they're trying to study humor in the lab, which mm. is difficult because to study humor, like in a brain scanner, you have to make people laugh on command, uh, which scientists are not the best at by by by, by most. In people. general, yeah, yeah it's it, it, it's a stereotype, but it's a reasonable one. Yeah. Um, But you know, so but you know, they, they they are ways around it. If people have worked on it, but the the fact is, like they're trying to isolate the part of the brain which is responsible for humor, as in mm. the experience whereby something goes from being not funny to being funny. Where does that happen? Where does that change over occur? What's going on in the brain to make that occur? And we think, given what we've got, it's all to do with incongruity. It's like something is presented to us and it doesn't work in how we understand how the world works. It could be words, like words don't work that way, or a situation or people behaving or just like you're in this place, you shouldn't be here like a, like a penguin in the desert. Like that's, that's that doesn't work. But so we were presented with um, an incongruous, uh, an inconsistency with our mm-hmm. understanding of the world. And that normally gives us a bit of tension, a bit of, oh, I don't like yeah. that because the brain- Something doesn't, doesn't fit. Yeah, it doesn't fit. Yeah. But then it's resolved safely or, um, you know, harmlessly. Mm. I mean, oh, okay, I like that. I like it when things are resolved. Like I've learned something new. Yeah. Uh, that was a pleasurable solving of the, the, the incongruousness. And that's good. Then you laugh because like, so, ah, I reckon it. Like, like with slapstick, you know, someone falling over uh, and landed on like their head and going, that's, that's funny. Someone's landed over and their head cracks and blood. Oh, that's not funny. That's like, not it's like, funny that's, that's not a safe person. That's horrible. That's a, uh, yeah. So someone's been embarrassed. It's, uh, but um, yeah, so they try to pin that down the brain, but mm-hmm. it turns out that they got like to a sort of certain region between like three of the lobes uh, with all, they all meet the, the junctions, but because the human brain is so good at humor, we're so adept at it, at, uh, we, it happens too fast for our best scanners to track. Oh, it, really? It's like, there you go. Like, it's like so, so, we're so good at it. Like, because we, we laugh all the time. It's a big part of life, isn't it? So yeah. we're so adept at it that we actually have, um, uh, we have, uh, no, it, it, it bests our scanners. Our technology cannot find it. It's too quick, mm. which is something, I don't know, you, you might have cut this, but uh, it's something which also applies to uh, the male orgasm in, in the mm. brain. That, that, that That's over and gone too quick for the scanners to catch. So, uh It's a, uh, you know, it's like uh, I feel really bad for the scientists who found that out because that must have been a very one of the biggest unpleasant. issues. <laughs> is so fast. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Can't track it. Oh, it's gone. 
I, I gotta tell this my wife. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Sex isn't short, honey. It's just science. <laughs> yes, it's faster than light. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's actually it's actually impressive when you think about it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, great. It, it's been great talking to you. Thank you so much. Thank you, honey. But pleasure, before be, before I let you go, I uh, ask one one last question to all of my guests. Okay. And it goes like that: If you could meet yourself. Mm. At the age of fifteen, what would you say to yourself? Yeah, uh, this is going to be annoying for you because I'm a science fiction uh, enthusiast. So, <laughs> some, some, no, no, you can't say it's uh, impossible. No, 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 no. Some details. <laughs> sure. Am I traveling back in time, or is he coming no, here? No, no, he's he's coming here. Just All right, l- like okay. right now. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so first, I say, how did you do that? Because quite frankly, I'm impressed because I don't remember that. <laughs> um, yeah, that's a nice. One. Yeah, that's yeah. the one question. But I don't know it's um because. Like, I wouldn't want to, again, I, the mm-hmm. sci-fi thing, I, I don't want to change my past because I'm very happy where I've ended up. Sure. And it was all to do with, none of it was planned. Mm-hmm. Like it was mm-hmm. all like almost a chaos theory thing. So if I say something to my past self, feel like change his mind about something, I won't be here. And that'll, mm-hmm. I'll be annoyed at that because I'm, I'm quite quite pleased with where I've ended up. Um, I guess I, I'd like to say, like, you know, you know I got a word for you, science blogging. That's where you want to get into. And he's like, what? <laughs> <'Cause> <laughs> he's 15 and he's from South Wales. He has no idea what that is. Okay. And he goes, okay. And then hopefully maybe they'll, maybe I'll get into it a bit earlier. But uh, yes, so science blogging, that's the key. You say, what happened to you? Why, why are you like this? <laughs> <laughs> and then the conversation yeah. starts. Yes, yeah, like, yeah. well, now I'm going to sabotage you. <laughs> so, that's a great yeah. answer. Oh, Thank you so I, much. I did. Th- I thought about it. <laughs> Thank like, you. Mm-hmm.